But it's perfect timing for today's discussion. I guess we we won't say that you're here for another for a loose foundation activity. We, so we'll say we planned this because we knew <laughs> months ago that the Lianghui was going to end uh, today. <laughs> so um, I'll go along with that. We'll go along I'll with go that. Along. So we really had great foresight when nobody else when nobody else knew. <laughs> but <clears throat> Jeff needs no introduction. I think to all, he's not only being a board member of the National Committee, but really, I think one of the academics who seeks to make China understandable to kind of the, the U.S. public, which is something that is so important, doesn't really stay in his ivory tower and attempts to both write and speak to people uh, around the country, which is something the National Committee deeply appreciates and tries to do. But you've got his bio, he's, you know, extraordinarily influential. Today is going to be a discussion really of current events and kind of he's got a way that he's going to talk about it and I won't use up his time um, to do that. But it's wonderful to have you here, wonderful that the, you have come to New York at this time and wonderful that we could take advantage of your, your presence. But welcome. Thanks so much. Um, I'm delighted to always do things related to the National Committee and I think actually the reason Besides the foresight of the committee thinking this would be a good time for me to be here, the other reason I'm here is by virtue of the Luce Foundation um, bringing me out to read grant applications for a new program at ACLS, ACLS that they're funding. And it's a very fitting tie-in because the Luce Foundation has um, been wonderful at supporting all kinds of projects that bring China to larger audiences. I first became involved with them working as a um, indirectly working as an advisor to the film The Gate of Heavenly Peace that was being supported in part by a grant from them. And I see a lot of what I do as very much in step with the public intellectuals program that the National Committee and Luce have worked on together. What I want to do is um, deal with some issues in the news now, thinking about them from the perspective of a cultural historian who tends to move between the past and the present. And I'll particularly be talking about revisiting parts of a couple of books I've done that move between the past and the present and seeing what needs to be updated about them or not. Um, these were books that came out in 2007 and um, 2010, respectively. And the one from 2010, China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know, is one that I actually did just finish updating. A new edition will come out. Um, in June, and I will shamelessly plug that in passing while showing you some pictures that I hope will spark some, um, spark some of my comments and perhaps spark some of your questions afterwards. Um, a lot, this is not one of the books that I'm going to revisit, but it's um, the book that I published last fall that is part of this connecting scholarly and journalistic discussions of China, scholarly and public discussions of China. It's a collection of um, pieces by a mixture of journalists writing in a sustained manner and the kinds of journalists who go deep into China and also academics who are willing to write chapters leaving their footnotes and specialized language at the door. Um, as a coming attraction, I'm going to do, I've co-edited, I've edited a special section of Descent Magazine that will come out in the spring that deals with China that is titled China's 99% and has a set of, of um, articles by, um, by mostly journalists with long-term China experience writing in a sustained manner about the kinds of issues that take you beyond the headlines of the stories in the news. So that's something to watch for. There's also an e-book that I just released in the same um, style, co-edited um, with Anjali Shah, um, a very talented freelance um, journalist. And these are pieces that all first appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, an online only publication that has started creatively issuing little ebooks based on content that's appeared on the web, plus two pieces that haven't appeared there yet. The cover is an Ai Weiwei um, illustration that they were able to get permission. Um, to do, and it, one of the special content not yet out pieces is um, Helen Gao's review of Han Han's book. Helen Gao is um, an example of a new kind of China journalist I think we're going to be hearing more about. She's from China, came here and got an um, undergraduate education at Yale, and has now gone back to China to report from Beijing. 
and she seems the perfect person to review Han Han, who um, all younger Chinese know, and um, not all older Chinese or um, academics or China specialists of my generation followed so much or followed until recently. But I thought it would be great, because she's in her 20s, for her to write about Han Han. And I said, you know, do you read Han Han? And she says, oh, yeah. My mom really likes him a lot, too, which made me realize now there are a couple of generations younger than me reading this kind of stuff. But one of the books that I actually, that I actually do want to talk about, China's Brave New World, was a collection of uh, cultural commentary pieces um, mostly on China that came out in 2007. And so I was thinking about, while following stories in the news, how some of them related to, but maybe called for an updating of, um, things that I wrote in that book. And one of the chapters in that was called, what was called Mr. Mao Ringtones. And it played with the idea of Mao coming back to life and walking around a bookstore in China. And I thought it was interesting what he would make of that in 2007. I wonder what would he make of it in 2013. I could revisit that. Another um, was about Hong Kong and about how continually going from the mainland to Hong Kong, I noticed uh, up to 2007 in my various trips that there were different ways in which the contrast between in the, the mainland and Hong Kong struck me differently at different moments of that. And I've just come back from going from Shanghai to Hong Kong and then back again. So I thought I'd revisit that and saying, what is it that people in the mainland think is different about Hong Kong and maybe they envy about people in Hong Kong and how that's changed from the mid-1980s when I first made that trip to the present. So this is um, the story about Mao in China's Brave New World played with the idea of Mao coming back to life, which some other people have played with. But I think I'm the only one who, since I was writing this when I had small children, said that the glass coffin he lays in in Tiananmen Square reminds me of the one that a sleeping princess might be lying in in a Disney movie. And so that I imagine him being kissed and brought back to life. But what I've, what I've never figured out is who would kiss him. But if he came back to life, I've said, this is, I looked at various sites in China that I thought might perplex him. And one I hit on as the focus of that story, of that um, essay, was the Libari Avant-Garde in Nanjing, which was one of the first and most interesting Chinese independent bookstores. And early in the 21st century, I went there and noticed that there were some things that Mao wouldn't expect to see in a bookstore of his days, like a picture of James Joyce, who was dismissed. If, if under Mao, writing was supposed to be realist, socialist realist writing, M Joyce is about as far from realistic as you can get with his experiments with wordplay. And he was denounced in, uh, by, by Marxist thinkers of the time as the ultimate kind of bourgeois decadent writer. Um, he was pretty much ignored in China uh, under Mao, but he was reviled in some writings from the Soviet Union. And so there he is. Other things on the bookstore, and this is a shot from, the, from 20, 2002, were guides to how to open your own cafe, guides to drinking coffee, all these kinds of bourgeois decadent things that Mao would find very strange. Especially strange, though, to Mao would be the philosophy section of the bookstore, which had things like a history of liberalism. And in the, in the philosophy sections, or they'd be called theory sections under Mao, the only writings would be uh, by orthodox Marxist writers. And you wouldn't find things by other kinds of writers that were starting to slip in from the early 21st century. Um, one thing that I hadn't seen show up yet in bookstores then, but more recently on most recent trips, and this is a shot from a more recent trip to, Sh to Shanghai bookstores, is 1984 by George Orwell. One of the defining features of Communist Party states um, before the fall of the Berlin Wall was in those countries, everybody read Orwell and thought about 1984, all intellectuals, thought of 1984 as the book that kind of captured uh, life within um, their kind of system, but it could only be read in underground secretive editions. Because what Communist Party states tended to think was that this was a subversive um, work. It was so clearly attacking the kinds of structures they had that you couldn't sell that kind of book in public. But in Chinese bookstores, you now have that. Not only that, but I saw in um, Shanghai this most recent time, 
Of course, this was unfortunately closed the day I went to check it out, but there's even a bookstore called 1984 Bookstore. <laughs> so China's not only gone from, moved from being an Orwellian state where you can't sell or talk about Orwell to being one where you, um, you can have a 1984 bookstore. When I imagined what Mao would make of all this, I thought, you know, he might be scandalized. What are his successors doing? Or he might, thinking about his youth, get kind of nostalgic because the 1910s when he was growing up, when he was a young man, was also a time when Chinese were reading things from all around the world, trying to find out what people were thinking about everywhere. But then I thought maybe what he'd think is these current leaders are really shrewd. Intellectuals and students have been a problematic group. Maybe if we give them some of the consumer goods that they like and that will keep them occupied and keep them busy, they might stay off the streets. Maybe they're really shrewd. And we can think about that as part of the Communist Party's ruling strategy since then. And this leads to the most recent um, books that I've seen in Ch Chinese bookstores that struck me as interesting, Origins of Totalitarianism. And George Soros is the Open Society. These are books that you would think of as, the, as some of the most taboo works in a Communist Party run state. But actually, this is the other thing Mao would note. All of these things that indirectly challenge the Chinese Communist Party are suddenly being sold because people are going to read them anyway in Sami's dot versions or perhaps um, when they go abroad. But what you don't see in these bookstores are things that directly challenge the Communist Party state. Analogy is OK, but direct is not OK. So in other words, there's nothing by Wei Jingsheng. There's nothing directly about the June 4th massacre. There's nothing celebrating the Dalai Lama. And the most recent Chinese book that's become a surprise bestseller is this one, which I brought for show and tell, um, a copy of it. It's a big, fat book. And this is only the first third of the uh, planned three-volume translation. It's a Finnegan's Wake. So it's gone from James Joyce being on the wall to James Joyce. Ulysses was a big seller in the mid-1990s, and this one's an even bigger seller now. And if you want to think of a way to keep intellectuals too busy to go on the streets, <laughs> think about Finnegan's Wake. I can say more about Finnegan's Wake because I, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating story, but I'll move on from here. And they actually had a big billboard up to, to sell it, and this, was a, this became a story, AP covered that you know, Joyce is selling like hotcakes in, in um, China. Well, one reason it was selling well is because there was a, a, a poster up. And why would you even put a poster up thinking you're going to sell a lot of copies? Well, it turns out that a lot of other big, notoriously difficult to read books by Western writers have been selling really well in China recently, I found out when I asked a store, a store clerk, why is this selling well? And she said, oh, because it's the new one. And other ones like it have been selling well. I said, and I looked over on a table. There was Proust's Remembrance of Things Past, three volume of this. I mean, this is, these are the kinds of books that American intellectuals, and I plead guilty, like to pretend we've read, but often <laughs> haven't. And I looked at the Proust thing, and it was a few years old. It had gone through seven printings. Gravity's Rainbow, how many people have read? Anyway, another notoriously hard book to read gone through three printings in the last few years. So this is a fascinating um, story to me and something I'm going to be writing about jointly with um, James Carter, a uh, National Committee PIP. So fitting that um, we'd be collaborating on this. Um, the other thing that come to mind about Mao being brought back to life is now there's been a store, uh, book by Yen Lian Ke um, called Lenin's Kisses that imagines um, that Lenin's body is bought by a Chinese village that wants to, to create a tourist attraction. And the Russians wanted to get rid of Lenin's body. They were going to bring it and put it on display in a kind of theme park, a fun piece. So I want to ask Mao what he thinks about this. And of course, putting leaders under glass has recently taken a new turn with Chavez is going to be put under glass. So there'd be a lot to talk about a revived, to, with a revived Mao besides the bookstores. So from Shanghai to Hong Kong, 1987 to, 20, to, to 2013. When I first went from Shanghai to Hong Kong in 1987, midway through a year in um, Shanghai doing um, dissertation research, I want to remind you, and those who've only been going to China recently may find this hard to believe, Shanghai in the mid-1980s was the most boring city I had ever lived in in my life. It was also one of the safest cities I had ever lived in, or perhaps the safest city I'd ever lived in in my life. Things have changed a lot. Going to Hong Kong, it was quite clear. It was going from a world where department stores didn't quite look like this anymore. This is from an earlier period. But 
the number one department store didn't have a lot for sale in um, the mid-1980s in Shanghai, to going to Hong Kong where you had these, you know, these palaces of consumption um, and places that looked like this. But this is now Shanghai. So going from Shanghai to Hong Kong in the mid-80s, wow, my, my wife and I were just, you know, we were paralyzed by the choices of things to buy, things to eat. Shanghai only had about four private restaurants. Hong Kong, we were like having these bizarre conversations. Well, we had pizza tonight. Should we go out for Indian food tomorrow or Austrian food or anyone? If, and in China, you know, in Shanghai at that point, it was do we go to the Peace Hotel or do we go to Meilongzhen? You know, these were pretty much all there were. So choices about what to buy, how to be entertained, um, and what to eat were the, 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 the kinds of things. And when I got back to Shanghai, people said, what was Hong Kong like? We've heard these stories about all the things you can do and buy. And by the 1990s, that wasn't what people were saying when you got back from, um, when you moved between Shanghai and Hong Kong. And by the early 21st century, it was, oh, what's it like using the internet there? This is Jing Cheng and Cha Cha, the uh, icons of the internet control, um, the police that keep care of what you do on the internet. So by the early 21st century, for me, when I went from, from mainland to Hong Kong, there wasn't a change from Shanghai to Hong Kong, what kind of food you could eat, about buying things, but there was a difference about using the internet. So I took this photo as soon as I got from Shanghai to Hong Kong of the fact that I could access the China Beat blog that I, um, that I was involved with when it was running from 2008 to 2012. It was blocked on the mainland, but here I was in, in Hong Kong being able to, to, to view it. And, um, but now, what is it that people on the mainland envy about people in Hong Kong? At the moment, it's that you can buy safe things. And this is a, a shot of the milk, uh, the, one of the milk scandals. The last time I, when I landed in, Shanghai, in Hong Kong um, a couple of weeks ago, what they were announcing over the airport security was wh where we had the announcements about um, liquids that you are and aren't allowed to bring on the planes. This was about only two cans of baby formula could be taken from, uh, powdered milk can be taken from Hong Kong to the mainland or you will be, um, or you will have it confiscated. And there was apparently an editorial cartoon, which I couldn't find a copy of, that shows that it was in a Hong Kong newspaper that says somebody, it's airport security saying, oh, there was white powder in his bag, but it wasn't milk powder. It was only cocaine, let him through. <laughs> but you know, one of the differences in the early 21st century and in the 1990s was that bookstores were radically different in, um, in the mainland and Hong Kong. And this distance has sort of closed a bit for the things I've been talking about. It used to be that you could only buy Hannah Arendt in Hong Kong, not in China. It used to be that you could only buy 1984 in Hong Kong, but not in Shanghai. But now you can buy those things. And in fact, you can buy a lot of um, books. So this is um, Ezra Vogel's Deng Xiaoping biography, J.K. Rowling's Casual Vacancy. Harry Potter was a big hit in China. so. Um, you know, and so her, her first adult book was a big hit in China. Ezra Vogel, you know, biographies of, of leaders. So this is actually a shot of a Shanghai um, bookstore. And this is a shot of a uh, Hong Kong bookstore. Same two books. So pretty much the same. You can move between the two. But it's not completely the same. If you look more closely, in the Hong Kong bookstore, and only the Hong Kong bookstore, you might have this book on Che, uh, I'm not sure about Aung San Suu Kyi. I'd be curious about that. But you would not have, and a book on Gandhi, those you might have on the mainland. Almost anything goes when it's not about China, but you definitely do not have that. And by the way, what one uh, Hong Kong professor mentioned to me when I was in Hong Kong was that a friend of his um, asked him to bring, on the mainland, asked him to bring a copy next time he comes of the Hong Kong edition of Ezra Vogel's book on Deng Xiaoping. Because in fact, while the book with the same cover is published in, on the mainland and in Hong Kong, big sections of the Tiananmen chapter are excised um, from, the, uh, from the mainland edition. So there are still differences. You don't see sites like this on the Hong Kong streets. Falun Gong is good. You will not see that on the mainland. And um, you will not see a Tiananmen veteran, like Han Dong Fang, the labor organizer who it was a big thrill for me to meet at um, 
at an event in, in Hong Kong. He's engaged with um, China Labor Bulletin, monitoring things across the border. And so it's quite striking, even though the discourse in Hong Kong is always about autonomy being chipped away, which of course is something that is important to worry about, but it's still staggering to me, and I think a lot of us, how much you can do after 1997 that could not be done on the mainland, including uh, still published books on, on Tiananmen and um, somebody like Han Dongfang um, be there. Um, so this is the book, China in the 21st Century. The other book that I'll talk about very quickly that I actually have updated. It came out in um, 2010, put the proofs to bed late in 2009. And the question is, in updating it, you obviously have to take care of things that have happened since then. And it was amazing to me how many things were not in the index that now seem like routine things that you should have to deal with. The book doesn't mention Ai Weiwei or Liu Xiaobo or Xi Jinping, for just starters. So there was a lot that needed to be updated, but there were also a lot of things, basic points, that I think are still pretty much the same from that period about past and present. And I figure when a talk like this about events in the news, I really better be talking largely, I mean, the, the, the photo of this was about how can we have so much cultural change since the mid-1980s that leads to scenes like this that were unimaginable in the 80s, and yet still have scenes like this of everybody clapping in unison at a party congress that are still almost unchanged. And that's, I think, the big dilemma for all of us wrestling with China. How do you explain the economic and cultural shifts and the relative political continuity? Now, of course, at an event like this, with what we've all been reading and stuff in the news, what I really need to talk about at some point, you know, with some focus, is the recent occasion in which a large authoritarian organization um, has just, you know, had a new leader take control, who now has, um, can set the order of things for a billion or so people. And there's a debate, you know, there's been a debate about how much he'll reform and how much he'll conserve and stick with past things. And, you know, we've all been watching a setting where there's, um, you know, there's been a part of the installment of him has been a lot of old men who dress alike. Um, being involved in the selecting him. And the question is, you know, uh, how will he deal with issues of corruption that everybody knows really need to be taken, um, taken seriously, but it seems that they have never been taken seriously. But I actually really don't want to say much about the Pope. <laughs> um, what I will say is that I'm not the only one. I, when I was in China uh, and, and Hong Kong, since I had horrible jet lag, I watch CNN and BBC News much more than I do in other places. And it was amazing how they were toggling between the story of China and the story of, um, of, of the papacy. And it was also very interesting. I saw at one point, um, I think it was BBC had a report that said there's one country that's not very interested in uh, the Pope, and that's China. And they showed you know, newspapers that didn't mention it. But another day I was watching CCTV and I saw a whole detailed explanation about how the popes are chosen and the white smoke and all that. So there actually was a fair amount of interest in, in China in this. And now there have been some interest in um, people, you know, I'm not the only one who's talking about the parallels between the elections, uh, the not very democratic elections, uh, <laughs> shall we say. Um, and in China there's been a fair amount of um, discussion of it, and among China watchers, so I'm putting up just a few tweets. This one retweeted by James Fallows, who's already, Xi Jinping's 99.86% win tops Bashar al-Assad's 97.62, and so forth. Um, the real question, and I don't have the answer, is who was the one person who voted no on Xi Jinping? But I, I also... Um, and, the, and the three who abstained. And the three who abstained, equally interesting. Tea Leaf Nation, something... Then they got confused. Then they got good <laughs> uh, Tea Leaf Nation, which I highly recommend any of you who are looking for a place to find out what's going on, uh, chatter on the Chinese internet. There's a lot on um, the Chinese internet. And this was one post on Sino Weibo about how much more efficient China is than the West. Because it didn't take them as many votes to figure out who was going to win <laughs> and moving forward. And there's been just a, a lot of... Um, 
fun with this on the web, which I'm sure uh, will continue. So anyway, here's when we flash forward to the, the images you're seeing coming out of China related to, this was from November when the new um, standing committee was being announced. It's not that, it doesn't require an updating of our cover photo for the book. I loved that <laughs> cover photo and luckily we get to use it still. Um, so here's the cover to the new edition due out in June in all formats and cheap paperback um, edition. It, we could keep that, we could keep that, um, and we could keep one of the jokes pretty much, which is um, when I've told this, when I've talked about this cover, I've said the top cover and the bottom cover are, show a study in contrast. Punks at a, at a concert and then leaders uh, all clapping in unison. But then when we examine it, there are actually some ties like the revolutionaries shown on the punks' t-shirts and the fact that they're all dressed alike and they're all dressed like people of their sort in the West tend to be dressed or in Japan or whatever. You know, youth around the world could be seen like this. Uh, powerful men around the world could be seen like this. That could be, you know, Japan rather than this. Um, but in, that's a break of the 80s and the present from the Mao era. In the Mao era, neither youth nor, um, nor elder statesmen dressed like their counterparts in other parts of the world. But what uh, my colleague Wang Feng pointed out when I gave this talk at, uh, when I gave a talk on the first edition at Irvine, he said, well, you haven't noticed the really interesting thing about the top and the bottom. They all dye their hair. <laughs> <laughs> so the really radical thing about Xi Jinping might be there was one photo that came out that showed him with some um, gray hairs poking through, um, which was brought to my attention by one of my favorite China journalists and bloggers, Evan Osnos. And um, that might confirm to me that Evan Osnos is somebody to really watch, that he could note this. But as he admitted in his blog, it was his wife who pointed that out to him. <laughs> so now I really hope she starts blogging so I can follow her. Um, there are five things I, you know, when I was talking about the, the, um, the first edition, and I'll just race through these, I would tell you, I can't tell you everything you need to know in a um, talk, so I'll tell you five things you need to know about China, I think. One is that China, which, Communist Party states used to always be thought as 1984 states with a hard authoritarianism where the government would tell you um, 2 plus 2 equals 5 and you had to say it was. And the state ruled by what Orwell said, the boot on the face over and over again. And then that was always seen as the way to, to criticize a Communist Party run state, whereas Brave New World, where the authorities ruled by playing to the pleasure principle and giving people, uh, playing to their desires, keeping them blissed out and distracted, that was the critique of capitalism. China now you need to think of as having its 1984 elements and its brave new world elements. There is both ele times when there's the boot on the face and times when there's the equivalent of brave new world pleasure principle things. And both are part of the system of control. And there's also, as I modified, and this I will leave untouched, there are not just, there are sort of moments that become more 1984-like again, when there's a Congress in session around um, Beijing. One person just tweeted this morning, as a foreigner in Beijing, what you really notice about the conference is you can't get your Hollywood movies on the black market for a couple of weeks as much, which is part of the kind of let, let people be distracted thing. Um, but there are moments that are more 1984, moments that are more Brave New World. There are also parts of the country that are more one or the other. Orwell's form of hard authoritarianism and more strict control is truer in Xinjiang and Tibet now. And in parts of the PRC, one part of the PRC, Hong Kong, it's much more Brave New World and very little 1984. Places like Shanghai and Beijing maybe waffle between the two. Um, so you have moments and elements of boot on the face, but you also, and you have moments of two plus two equals five, kind of um, the government says this is wrong, so this is you know, from The Simpsons. Um, but you have a lot that's the whole culture of distraction and playing to pleasures. And this, these are all shots in Shanghai. Um, you don't get much of this, everybody having to turn out for a loyalist rally, like kind of classic, you have the right often to be apolitical. And you know, that in Brave New World, it's that people are too busy and don't want to sort of check out on politics. Except you get more scenes a little bit like this, four shows of loyalty where people dress like in Tibet occasionally where there are efforts to call people out 
to prove um, their loyalty to the regime. In Hong Kong, you don't have those. You have, you have much more the brave new world, but it's important to remember you have those in part because of events like this. This is from the anti-brainwashing protests of last summer. It's not that just that Beijing has been slow to impose its kind of rule onto Hong Kong, which it has been slower than we expected. It's also that there's been such dramatic and often inspiring pushback from people in Hong Kong. Um, I wrote a piece recently about how in China it's, we are too often forced to choose either or choices, when instead, I said when I was growing up, one of the few things I associated with China were menus that you chose one from column A and one from column B, as opposed to the school cafeteria where it was chicken or beef. At a Chinese restaurant, it was a beef dish and a chicken dish. Unfortunately, in many discussions of China, we're said, oh, so is Xi Jinping a reformer or a conservative? How about somebody who will order off both those sides of the menu? Um, to have some conservative choices, some reformer ones. And I picked on um, Nicholas Kristof, who had come out with a piece saying a set of predictions about um, how he thought Xi Jinping would be a reformer. And I picked on some of his specific predictions, like that um, he said he was sure that Xi Jinping would be less robotic than Hu Jintao. I think that's setting the bar really low. And I think he will be. I think that was right, but I thought that was setting it low. But I thought his idea that, that he said he wasn't positive, but he thought the signs were of a real reformer. But how about somebody who'll be really likely a conservative in some ways, reformer in others, like say this guy, whose name is associated with reform, but Deng Xiaoping showed in 1989 that when it came to certain political things, he was gonna be very conservative. Um, Similarly, I think we're sometimes encouraged to think that creative figures are either going to be dissidents like Ai Weiwei, who consistently challenged the authorities, or loyalists like Zhang Yimou, who's moved to being a state choreographer. In fact, most of them order a bit from both the loyalist and the oppositional side of the menu. And I think that's true of Mo Yen, who skews toward, um, the, toward the loyalist side, but also has some kind of um, subtly subversive things in his novels. And it's true of Hugh Hua, who I won't say more about, but I think he's the most consistently interesting Chinese writer right now, writing um, his op-eds in the New York Times and the International Herald Tribune have been, been extraordinary. There was one just yesterday on why he likes his books being pirated, including this one that could only be published outside of China, but he's delighted that it circulates back in saying things that wouldn't be allowed. And rails against censorship, which Mo Yan famously said was just an inconvenience like airport security. But I think with both of them, the key point isn't that, isn't that you know, neither, it's not that Mo Yan is a, is a loyalist and, and Hu Hua is a, is a dissident. They're both working this gray zone between the two in different ways. Yu Hua, despite all the in your face things he says abroad, is still a member of the Official Writers Association. And the fact that that can still go on is such how complicated and interesting some things about China are. Han Han would be another example of somebody who um, gets censored but then does other things, is both um, within the system and, uh, and, uh, and challenging the system. Um, there's no single PRC internet story. I don't have to belabor that here um, to a group like this. But the store is, the internet in China is complex. And it's not just all about censorship, even though that's what I often end up talking about most and others do too. If you go to a Chinese internet cafe, a lot of what people are doing doesn't have to do with seeing news sources. It's playing games and doing what most people do most of the time on the internet everywhere. Figure out where you're going to eat tonight, who you might want to hook up with, um, what your friends have been doing. It's, it's all kinds of non-political things. Shop. And um, there's also, even though sometimes people say you t that Facebook is banned in China, well, yeah, but something like Facebook is there, QQ and other things, and, um, and they're different. The story isn't just about blocking of Western companies, it's also about Chinese companies that then end up doing something differently um, when they do things on their own. I'll skip through this. It's less surprising to a China savvy crowd. This I think is the single most important point I made in the 2010 book and I think it's equally or even more important now which is that the big question in China, uh, the big question about China in 1978 on many people's minds was can China modernize? And I think a lot of people around the world were rooting for it to modernize for different reasons. Now I think the big question on people's minds is at what cost modernization? 
now that China has developed, what is the cost to the world or to the Chinese people of the way it's been done? So, you know, everybody was rooting for the four modernizations outside of China. The idea was a weak China was a problem. We weren't then fearing a strong China. We were feeding, fearing a China that couldn't feed itself. Deng Xiaoping's four modernizations sounded good to us. And one reason they sounded good to Americans was we thought if they modernize, they will inevitably democratize. At the same time, um, and so here was a quote by John Denver saying when he played for Deng Xiaoping and his uh, wife at a meeting that we wish you and your people uh, best of luck on your new long march toward modernization in this century. Within China, Wei Jingsheng was also rooting for modernization, but he said he wanted China to modernize, but China couldn't without a fifth modernization, democracy and human rights. And he claimed, though, for it partly was without, without democracy and economic growth will confront insurmountable obstacles. So Americans are saying we want China to modernize because then it will democratize. Wei Jingsheng saying we want China to democratize because then it can modernize. And what's happened? The Chinese Communist Party has developed and modernized the country in some ways without having first democratized and without afterwards inevitably democratizing. And so you have Chinese cities that it look as modern, in some parts at least, as any in the West, in some ways more modern at, at certain moments. And yet you start to have people increasingly, the protests, and for the first time this year it was announced the first time that protests over quality of life pollution issues had outnumbered the other high reason, which was over um, land disputes. And so questions, people saying, we are concerned about how this kind of modernization is being shoved down our throats. And so now you have images like this symbolizing discontent or concern in China, a super modern city represented by the skyscraper and the giant videos, but smog so thick that you can't even see through it. And most recently, the story of the day, um, the dead pigs in <laughs> Shanghai, which have opened the, you know, the same time Life of Pi is generating a lot of discussion. So almost inevitably, Life of Pig um, things on the internet were bound to happen. Then the last point, um, China and the US, though radically different in many ways, are surprisingly similar in others. And this is something else I've left unchanged in the new edition. We're both these really big countries that say the one thing we're really against is imperialism, but a lot of the world looks at us and says, but you find a way of exerting your control over other places in disturbing ways. Um, we think of ourselves often as opposites, but we strike sometimes positive or negative ways similarly to people, uh, businessmen who come from from Korea or, or from South Korea or Japan and China sometimes say like in China as in the US, it can be confusing that the rules don't seem, hierarchies don't seem as absolutely clear in some companies. There, there's more of an easygoing manner in certain kinds of settings. Uh, how do we adjust to this? And, but the real similarity I think between China and the US is in part about China now paralleling things that the US went through and how the US was seen 100 years ago. We were the country in the late 19th century that Charles Dickens came to and said, it's great that they're reading my books, but they're all black market editions. This country doesn't play by international copyright. We were the country the, the Europeans would come and say, how do they build those tall buildings so fast? And th there was both admiration and concern about lack of labor unions, about uh, danger, endangerment of workers. There were a variety of things. There was admiration for America as a place where people could go from rags to riches in extraordinary ways, and people were admiring the people who managed to do that, much as in China today, stories of that are very um, popular. We were the first country outside of Europe to host a mega event. The big mega events then were World's Fairs. And we hosted, when we got to host a World's Fair, they'd only been held in London and Paris. We didn't just host one in Philadelphia in 1876. We hosted the biggest one in the history of the world of World's Fairs. When Shanghai finally got to host um, the, the World Expo in 2010, it hosted the biggest one the world had ever seen. And when China hosted the Olympics for the first time, when now that the Olympics have become the big mega event, it was again an eye-popping spectacle. So there are similarities of these, um, how we've replaced in different ways. Europeans used to come to America and be scared or excited about us representing what the future might hold and, and the way that now some Americans look at China. So um, 
you know, I've given a very flip talk. I showed an image of the Simpsons and so forth. Um, so I'd like to end with this image that I've shown about you know, the expos coming to Shanghai. I, I took this photo a few years ago, and I've used it in talks ever since then. Giant video screen in the middle of Shanghai that suggests Shanghai has multiple Times Squares, just like it has more tall buildings than New York. And I, I use it to represent many things, but now that increasingly the, the baby looks a little creepy to me. This is an oversized baby coming at you out of the screen. <laughs> and when I think about American feelings about China, and you know, again, I've, I've been flipped, so I want to reassert my scholarly credibility here. <laughs> this brings to mind a line by Homer, Simpson, who said, <laughs> children are our future unless we stop them now. <laughs> and I think America has gone from this idea, this moment of saying paternalistically to China, when are you going to grow up? When are you going to grow up? When are you going to go from being a kind of infant nation to a mature nation? And now, increasingly, our anxiety is, what are we going to do about not being the only big kid on the block? So thanks very much. I look forward to questions. Glad you were able to reestablish your scholarly credentials at the end. There you go. <laughs> hey, Finnegan's Wake, remember? <laughs> That's right. That's right. We, we should really take a poll and see who's read those various books. Mm -hmm. By the way, are those books, are there, they're translated in full. It's not like Ezra's book where you've had these deletions. If it doesn't relate to China, it's pretty much. It's pretty much translated in full. And this is translated with copious notes, explanatory notes. Um, and so one idea is, I'm trying to figure out why people might buy it. One would be to just display on your coffee table <laughs> as a sign that you're a cultured, sophisticated person. And, less, and you know, so, so it's a kind of almost unreadable in English book that nobody in America is really reading. But people would, would you know, put it on their coffee table like this, which reminds me a little bit of, um, say in the 1960s, there was a book that makes no sense in Chinese unless you read the copious notes by it. And nobody in China was reading in the 1960s. But if you were a sophisticated Berkeleyite, you'd probably want it on your coffee table, the Yijing. <laughs> so that kind of the cachet of the foreign, the exotic, the difficult, it's not just China. You were, you were um, kind of poking fun at, at uh, Nick's View, Nick Kristof's view of, of Xi Jinping as a reformer or as a, uh, as a conservative, and I think you're absolutely right, it's both. And he's actually, I think he's already expressed views yeah. that in terms yeah. of democratization don't expect it, but in terms of other kinds of political reform, you yeah. should expect it, more rule of law, more, you know, less corruption, cracking down on these various abuses. Um, how does that, what does that make you, try to look forward a little bit and talk about how do you, what you think will go on in, during his, his five years, um, the next five, well, it'll be 10 years, but the next five years, what kinds of changes should we be looking for from him? Well, I'd love to be, you know, I'd love to be proved wrong. I guess what, and, you know, Christoph was subtler than that. He, you know, he, he said, this is what I'd like to see, and I don't expect some things. And this, I think what was strange, and I wasn't the only one to point it out, was the things that were being said were very similar to things that were said about Hu Jintao right. at the beginning. And it doesn't mean that one of these days somebody will live up to those. So it was to take it with a grain of salt. But I mean, for me, quite simply, what would mean a lot to me, because you know, Hu Jintao said, I'm going to get serious about corruption. He clearly didn't. And you know, Xi Jinping is doing, I think some symbolism is important, and he's been making some important symbolic gestures. Um, and I'm curious, there have been some signs that some of his um, appointees that he's having some control over are skewing more toward um, the more reformist side, people who order more from the reformist side of the menu. I guess what I'd like to see is somebody who's a clear ally of Xi Jinping raked over the coals for corruption. That would mean a lot. In other words, it doesn't mean anything if either somebody who can be seen as a kind of renegade local official or somebody who's near the center but is a clear political rival gets criticized. When you really know things have reached a point is when somebody who's you know quite clearly within the, the, the faction is taken to task for an, an egregious form of corruption. And you can't say that there, there aren't any people who could be that kind of thing. So, so that's what I'd be watching for, um, I suppose. 
I mean, I think it's right to, in general, what we really need to watch for are things like, I, I don't, I mean, I think keeping our eye on, which some people, not in this room, but will ask me, it's like, when is China going to have national elections, for example? I, I don't think that's, that's not keeping your eye on the ball. I think it's, when will there be a more, um, a, a freer press that can call the government to task more consistently? So I was worried about the um, Nanfang Zhou Mo case, as I think a lot of people were. This was one of the first challenges for Xi Jinping, and it's, it's still not clear how he handled it and, or how, what the spinoff from that would be. But I think those are the kinds of things to keep an eye on, is, is, is there going to be more transparency? Is there more freedom of uh, the press? Is there more of the rule of law in various ways? And those are, I think, the things exactly to keep an eye on. Yeah, Carl, Carl, Miser, Carl Misner was that, where's Carl? telling me right before lunch that the appointment as the head of the Supreme Court is somebody who is, actually has quite impressive legal credentials rather than being somebody who's much more out of the party side. So that's actually a real sign that maybe this is more serious. Let me, that's we, don't, we don't have tons of time, so let me yeah. open the, uh, the floor to, to some questions. In the back, I don't recognize yes, um, I tell, me your, tell me your name, though. Uh, my name is Bruce Peer. I work for Congresswoman Carol Maloney. Thank you. A free really trip wasn't enough. No, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was uh, really struck by the uh, example you had of the hair dyed men, both younger and older. But it did strike me that uh, you know we have that current goal. They are all men. Uh, again, we have no indication of any women entering the top ranks of the government leadership. Uh, there was a very interesting segment on 60 Minutes a couple weeks ago about the. A woman running a Soho uh, construction yeah. firm that's built so much in Shanghai and Beijing. But I'm wondering, really, where you know, where is China in terms of uh, women moving more equally into all ranks of society, in the corporate world, in government, uh, and, and in other positions of influence? That's a. I mean, that's a great question. I think it's one of the consistently under under reported, under covered story because, in fact. Um, it's important in part because this is a, even though the top leadership under Mao was still all male, almost all male, most of the time, there was much more formal attention to male-female equality under Mao. It's been one thing that's been a, a story of a turn, a negative turn since um, in the post-Mao period because there was a retreat from kind of, you know, Maoist era forms of male-female equality, but also when capitalism came in, into or the market came in in China, came in without some of the gradually accrued protections against like sexual discrimination that accumulated over time in the West. So in China, you can have advertisements still for people to work in certain public positions in companies where they'll say a woman must have, I mean, for things that, were, that are throwbacks to the 50s or before in America, we're only looking for women with bust sizes of X, Y, and Z, height, weight can't be above this, the things that would be considered sexual discrimination here but wouldn't be there. There was, There is a female spokesperson that's been appointed for the National People's Congress if you're looking for any straws to grasp at or ways that perhaps on this issue the Chinese Communist Party might have more hope for change than the Vatican, but, um, you know, which is another one. But, Talk um, about low bars. There's a low bar. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Um, no, it's a it's a great issue, and I'm really glad. I don't. I mean, I've I've been interested in this for a long time. But in the forthcoming issue of Dissent coming out in in the spring, we I commissioned Lita Hong Fincher, who's been doing some of the best um, blogging and short writing on this, to do an extended piece on uh, exactly this uh, and the way that the women's organization, like the labor organization, being as much about controlling labor in the party's way as actually promoting workers' rights. The, the official women's association isn't doing much about this and sometimes doing retrograde things. And there are NGOs and individual feminists pushing back about it, but it's, it's, I, don't see, I don't see signs of improvement recently. But it's a great question. Yeah, they've got, obviously only two of 25 Politburo members are women. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, you have a female literacy rate in China that I think is close to 100%. Yeah, I mean, this I mean, is... It's, it's yeah. extraordinary. And that, that has actually served as 
one of the real engines for economic growth, something which we often look at India as this democracy and, yeah. and say, ah, oh, it's great, but the female literacy rate in India, I believe, is under 60%, if I'm not mistaken, and in China, it's nearly 100%. So it's an interesting dichotomy. Well, where at the highest levels, they're not getting it, but then at the basic level, they're getting um, well, pretty good food. Pallavi Iyer, who was the Hindu's China correspondent for a while, and uh, wrote a lovely book about India and China from her perspective. She's played the game of would I rather be born in India or China, which apparently some economists play. And she said, when I think about that, first I want to say, which class am I born in and which gender am I? And she said, you know, if I'm an elite man, have me born in India. Because I'll have all these, you know, I can read whatever I want. I'll have these kinds of political choices as well as others. If I'm a poor man, I think I'd rather be born in China because the odds of rising out of my low position. If I'm a woman, there's a good reason to be born in China, because even though there's you know discrimination in both cases, she said being a, in, out in public as a woman in China is much easier than being out in public in certain settings. Anyway, she's subtler than that, but I think it's a really neat way to reframe the China. She probably should have said, and, and I'll probably be able to read. You know, yeah. Spells. Yeah, uh, Jeff, thanks very much. It's, it's a lot of fun to watch the video. I would just add one thing. really understand that there is not going to be anything taking place very fast. I mean, you know, people have expectations. Okay, let's contemplate them over. Let's see what happens in the next month. Nothing's going to happen fast. They don't work fast. They're going to take their time. It's going to move these positions. And I think all of us are uh, very optimistic. We have to be. But, you know, you asked about the move on anti-corruption. There's a smart move that he could take. He could take the credit now that the conclave is over and just put Bo Shilai at the trial. Mm -hmm. then put him in house arrest for the rest of his life. Who get the credit for it? Number two is to watch how much power he gives to Huang Shishan yeah. in terms of cleaning up. But, you know, it's the old story already. They go three steps forward and two steps back. You know, they took, uh, they took Chairman Guo out of CSRC, or they allegedly have, because he's too much of a reformist, and he was cleaning up the front office on the security group. And where did they send him? Governor uh, Shango. So... I think that's that's a great point. These are gradual, and there's almost, and the whole temporality of things in China, it's very peculiar because, like, all the drama happened before the event. You know, it was kind of an anticlimactic thing when he finally, you know, gets instantiated. But great point, I agree. Your question, but on that poll, the the, the may, a Chinese probably could tell me, but I think, as head of CSRC, I believe that's what you would call. Fubuji, you know, vice minister level, whereas a governor is Buji. So, in fact, even if they're getting him out of that, they, they have promoted. promoted him. He's not demoted. Mm -hmm. No, it's not, not only demoted, he's not demoted, he's I believe not, that's a promotion. Not, it's not clear that he's promoted, but he can come back. He can come back. Hmm. Yeah. Watch and see what happens. But they definitely wanted him out of stock exchange. Yeah, but we want to watch over still. Uh, what do you see as the uh, future for freedom of religion in China? Do you expect any change uh, at all? And, and particularly with the Catholic Church, the underground church, as opposed to the, 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 the official state church? Well, I think, I think what we should understand is there, there has been a dramatic increase in certain kinds of freedom of religion, obviously, and, the, and there's an enormous religious revival across China in many ways, which is partly about you know, seeking meaning and changing times and things. And um, Ian Johnson, I think, has been writing be beautifully about this in the New York Review books and elsewhere. Um, so I think one big leap has been the idea, and this is maybe the biggest thing about Mao in the bookstores, is the, the aspiration to control what people think and feel and do in private is largely gone. And I think that's an enormous difference and I, we shouldn't underestimate that. What the resistance has been is to any kind of organized, any kind of organization that, is, that resists control of the state. So, you know, that's why you can have these official forms of Christianity which are allowed, but, you know, and it's why the, the Catholic situation is so intense because there is this alternative authority. It's a really interesting moment for this, and I, I don't know what it'll, it'll 
I don't know if the new pope will make any difference. It's certainly interesting. I didn't think about it, but a scholar of Christ, uh, somebody who writes about Christianity who I ran into this morning was saying, and the fact that the new pope is a Jesuit is fascinating given the history of Jesuits in China. Right. You know, Pauline? Louder. Um, 18. 18. Anything, sir? Well, this is like going back to the 1880s rather than to um, the 1980s. It's a fascinating question. I haven't. I mean, you know, there was there was a lot of interest. Uh, you know, I talked to Joe Esherick, who had been in China um, during the centenary of the 1911 revolution, and he went to a lot of conferences and was asking him what was different. And um, a lot of times in the past, the discussion of the 1911 revolution was what was Sun Yat-sen's true mission and you know, who had stayed true to it and things. But he was saying this was the first time where there was any kind of discourse of might it have perhaps been better if 1911 hadn't happened? I mean, what if, what if some of the sprouts of a different kind of you know, reform and alternation had been allowed to happen rather than the kind of you know, and, I, and this fits in with some of the people who've been questioning the whole, whether the, the kind of almost virus of, Liu Xiaobo talked about the virus of this idea of revolution as a totalistic answer for everything that becomes in different hands taken in different ways. You know, what if there was a more kind of open-endedness, which would be one of the things from, you know, the, the late 19th century that was there. Um, I mean, certainly there are some things that going back further is interesting because you have things like, you know, revival of Confu or sort of an idea of a new form of Confucianism, and you know how you can connect Confucian. I, but I'm not sure that I see that as a continuity, as a kind of strategic reinvocation or return um, to something there. But there's, you know, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of interesting um, parallels there to think about. I'll think about that more. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question on uh, Chinese African relations. Um, I worked recently with a company called Shao Kong and it was like a 15 million. 15 a little louder, months. so everybody can. And how do you, do you feel that the relationship between China and Africa will be positive or will be disruptive? To who? For the to whom? <laughs> For the African continent. Um, yeah, here's another one where my best answer is to tell you the book to read on it, which isn't out yet. Howard French is writing a book on uh, China and Africa that I think will blow things out of the water. Because he was, he was the New York Times Africa correspondent for 10 years and wrote a, a really beautiful book about um, Africa. And he's really somebody who can talk about this with the first thing I think channeling him, he would say is, we can't think about Africa as a country. You know, We have to think about it will have very differential impacts in very different parts of Africa. Uh, and you know, and he was then the New York Times Shanghai correspondent for about five years, and wrote beautifully about about China. And so he's been going to Africa steadily and going to spend time in um, Chinese communities in Africa and sort of seeing on the ground how this is playing out. I mean, it's playing out in all kinds of ways. But I mean, this you know, it's it's, a, it's being the historian card. All of this, America. We always said we were not imperialists. We were doing things differently than the people who wanted to set up empires. We were just going and, but, but a lot of the way we tried to steer the fate of areas that um, were not formal colonies but had oil, say, that we wanted is fairly similar to what China's doing. Now, what China's doing is one step further, saying, yes, but America had this rhetoric of Americanization. They didn't want to control you, but they wanted to reshape your values and politics if possible. We don't want that. We just want you to develop on your own course like we're developing on our own course. And to some extent it works, but I think there's also going to be inevitably pushback when um, there's a feeling that local, that locales are, are not doing benefit, not really benefiting, but just a kind of corrupt government to corrupt government alliance is being, being forged. We have a whole program which you can go on our website 
and download on Africa-China relations where Deborah Brodigan speaks, and she has a book on China-Africa yeah, it's an important, relations. Yeah, it's an important book as which well. Is you know, one of the best ones written on that. Well, I need to bring this to a close because our kind hosts have another event that begins here uh, shortly hereafter. So um, thank you so much for coming. Thanks. And thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.